Welcome to What's the Risk, hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can better use to understand index and portfolio performance, along with addressing some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on the MSCI World X Australia Index with net divs reinvested and the MSCI World X Australia Index net divs hedged back in Australian dollars. This is constructed in a 50-50 split and rebalanced annually. Some people would know the ETFs that seek to track the return of these indices as Vanguard's VGS and VGAD, and it's about 14 to 1,500 large to mid-cap global stocks in 22 developed markets. Shameless plug, a book we wrote. This is available at Amazon. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say our intent is educational and not rendering financial advice. Uh, don't make us tap the sign. These are simple concepts we'd like investors to better understand performance in the short and long term so they can make informed decisions. So this is a brief explainer on hedging. I asked dimensional fund advisors to provide us with a precise explanation that should be helpful to the average investor. So the idea of hedging is to take an offsetting investment position in a security as made with the intention to reduce risk from price movements that are adverse to that security. Currency hedging specifically relates to attempting to reduce the effects of currency fluctuations on investment performance and is relevant for investors with foreign investments. For investors with unhedged foreign investments in USD, when their home currency appreciates in AUD, it has a negative impact on returns. When the AUD depreciates, the impact on returns is positive. For investors with hedged foreign investments in USD, when their home currency appreciates, it has a positive impact on returns when the AUD depreciates, the impact on returns is negative. A real life example, in 2014, the Australian dollar appreciated about 4% against the euro. This reduced the returns of unhedged euro denominated investments held by Australian investors. On the other hand, against the US dollar, the Australian dollar depreciated about 8.5% in 2014, enhancing the returns of unhedged US dollar investments held by Australian investors. Pretty good, Peter? Yeah, look, the way I've always talked with uh, the people we serve about hedging is where you need to hedge uh, the movements in currencies. In effect, you're buying insurance against the currency moving in the direction you don't want. It's certainly got a cost to it. That cost relative to a portfolio size is usually quite small, but it's designed specifically to smooth out the ride for the investor's where sometimes currencies move a lot and sometimes not in the direction you'd prefer. Periodic performance. So the top line is the 50-50 split rebalancing on an annual basis. And for context, down the bottom, got both the unhedged and the hedged version. It's not an exact midpoint, but you get a result somewhere between the two and you see the impact of the currency over the short and long term. Peter, our investment committee chooses to hedge international exposure 50-50 in the same way as the top line shows. I guess you'd probably explain why we do this. It's done principally, as I indicated just a minute ago, to try and smooth the ride out for investors in the longer term. As you can see, in the last year, obviously, returns have been very strong. Now, every investor's you know, happy with returns on an asset class of 20%, whether it's hedged or unhedged, was still above 20%. But as you can see, the combination, you know, is, as you pointed out, somewhere near the midpoint of those returns. Over short periods of time, those two numbers can actually be wildly different. You know, if it's in your favour, an investor will think, well, that's great. If it's not in your favour, then investors inevitably are disappointed. If you look at the, the results as the time series lengthens from three to five to 10 to 20 to 30 years, there are definitely periods in there where hedging was very valuable. That is, the Aussie dollar was appreciating relative to foreign currencies. And there are periods in there where hedging was not valuable because the Aussie dollar was falling relative to other currencies. As you can see in the, the lower half of the table, the first few time periods that are measured, the unhedged results are higher, which means over that decade across the board, the Aussie dollar has fallen relative to its international counterparts. But 20 and 30 year numbers show exactly the reverse, because over the period from 10 out to 30 years, the Aussie dollar has actually strengthened. The end result, as you can see, going right the way back to 
1988, some you know 35 years, the portfolio with a combination of hedged and unhedged sits in the midpoint. And without the hedging influence, it would have actually been a lesser result. Outcome of that on the next chart, the growth of wealth, exactly as you say, the 50-50 hedge, growth of a dollar here since inception in 1988, the unhedged has ended up having the worst result. The, the simple fact is over that long period of time, undertaking some hedging has been beneficial Despite the fact that for the last 10 years, and often investors would think 10 years is a long time, but obviously this chart points otherwise, but the last decade, uh, investors that were unhedged had a windfall, uh, but the longer term track record doesn't indicate that. Yeah, I suppose it's important to remember too, I mean, you could redraw this chart across so many different periods, and you're going to get a completely different result no matter what you do. Investors have so oh, I'm going to take a position that I'm going to be doing this or that, or, you know, I think the dollar is going to do that. I mean, you could really get your pants pulled down very quickly because I've looked at it myself sometimes like, oh, yes, I should be doing this. And then the dollar, something happens and the dollar just goes in a completely different direction. I recall all too clearly a prominent uh, Tasmanian uh, mining company that employed an awful lot of people in this state literally bet the house on the direction the Australian dollar was going to go and the business was wiped out completely over the space of about 18 months. They kept betting further and further and further on the direction of the currency, absolutely committed to the view that that, that direction was going to reverse, but it didn't. And, and that just reminds investors that sometimes markets, despite the best of analytics undertaken, can continue in directions that all of the traditional evidence would set, would suggest they shouldn't, but they actually still do. And range of returns and average returns. For those who remember just the uh, MSCI World Unedge that we did um, earlier, this is certainly just knocking out that first 13 years has removed some of the um, extremities in those returns. It's important to recognise that, you know, the, the, the one year, the three, the five, or, and even to a lesser extent, the 10 are very similar, yet, yet the 20 are not. Um, so much so. And and what that means is that wherever you place the 20-year period, there are obviously results in the years either prior or after the 20 years that have been really strong, which lend themselves to the higher average one-year return. That also means that in, in every 20 year that you pick, it just so happens that you've got a multiplicity of poor results. We're looking at a period from 1988 through to 2023. We've had the global financial crisis. We've had September 11. We've had the first Gulf War. We had the tech wreck, dot com, you know, bubble bursting. There have been a significant number of, of very difficult events that you can place inside every 20 year period that you measure. Um, and outside of that 20 years, you've got some big rebounds that come off the back of those falls after you know the, the panic uh, subsides. Rolling annual returns as usual, month on month off. 2000s, they're bookended by two periods because of the lost decade. And so hedging is nice, but it didn't save you from, from that issue. This chart, I think, really brilliantly portrays what I was you know, commenting on the prior slide. No matter where you pick in this particular chart, if you pick a 20 year period, you've actually got the majority of the poor times that have occurred over the whole 35 year period. That's simply the reason why the rolling 20 year numbers were lower than the uh, the shorter periods in question. And sorry, chance of positive negative return. The, ch the chance of a negative return obviously narrows as you go on, except for that uh, three to five period that we saw previously with just the MSO world. And it was obviously because of that three to five year where you can be have a nice three year period, but you get hit again in the five years because it, it overlaps with uh, another poor period. Uh, when you when you look at the fact that markets were declining in 2002 during the worst of the second Gulf War, but by 2007, they were already in decline again as we started the global financial crisis. So within that five-year period, just to give an example, there were two pretty awful results, both of which were followed by really strong gains. You'll see that here because I've actually included the, the double dip here, not just the largest fall in time to recovery, because I guess you could call this the Godfather 3 chart. 
just when I was out, they pulled me back in again. You got to the end of 2006 and That's right. you get about six months of gains, probably about 10% up and then you're straight back down again. Yeah, it was a very difficult period for international shares. And there, for me, there was quite an irony. And if you like an indicator of just how bad human behaviour is when it comes to investing, I can remember looking at charts promoted by all sorts of consultants around the 2012 period saying that, you know, investors shouldn't bother with investing in global shares. And they basically picked this sort of 10 year period, 12 year period to portray that. If that's all the evidence you had, maybe it was an appropriate choice. But we now also know that the chart on the right hand end of this particular chart looks a lot different. And we know for sure that it looked a whole lot different on the left. Uh, but if you left out that evidence, you would draw an inappropriate conclusion. Yeah, definitely some recency bias if you're um, promoting that theory. It's a little bit messy there towards the uh, edge, but you can see where they all sort of fit in there. I think there's a really good point to be made with this chart. The, the green diamond shape, which is the, the portfolio with the 50% hedging, it's almost exactly halfway between the hedged and unhedged in terms of returns. But as as Harry Markowitz predicted in his sort of landmark work about diversification, you know, you, you're getting less volatility for the amalgam of the two returns of the two components because you're actually diversifying different things, shares and currency. And sources and descriptions of data. So thanks for watching.